Hello, I am Eric Jean. I am a Managing Director at Accenture Consulting Practice in charge of finance and risk services for Galia. And I have the pleasure to, today to introduce uh, Adele for an interview on the fraud topic. And I will leave it to you, uh, Adele, to introduce yourself. Uh, so I'm Adele Sumner. I work for RSA Insurance in the counter fraud team. And my role is to head up an intelligence and strategic development function in terms of combating fraud for the RSA UK. Good. So the topic of our discussion today is, uh, is about uh, fraud and uh, what uh, insurance companies are doing uh, about it. Mm -hmm. So what is uh, the biggest trend you see in the, in the fraud? So over the last 10 to 15 years, the biggest problem for insurance fraud has, has been typified as the crash for cash gangs, the motor insurance fraud, the staging of accidents, the induced accidents, and the generation of, I suppose, fraudulent whiplash and injury claims. We've seen a real change in probably the last 12 to 18 months of that fraud moving because of the changes in the what we call um, the LASPO effect, which is we've changed the laws in the UK, um, to an ever-increasing amount of deafness claims. So noise-induced hearing loss claims are now probably some of the highest volumes of potential fraudulent claims in the UK, followed very quickly by what we would call or determine as application fraud, where people are lying on the front end of the policy to obtain an insurance that they are not entitled to. And what I mean by that is actually providing us with false identity, identification information. They don't live at the address they say they live at. They're not the person they say they are. They don't give us a correct date of birth. So that's really to just obtain motor insurance to drive around the UK. I would say those two are, are really our biggest risks. One's a claims-based traditional insurance fraud with the deafness side of it. The other side of it with the policy fraud is, mm. is probably a really new trend um, and it's a very different set of controls that you need to identify both types of fraud. Okay, so with this uh, trend of uh, increasing in both in terms of volume and uh, I would say diversity, mm -hmm. uh, how are you managing in adapting your models to, to cope with this uh, new environment? So we have um, a number of big data uh, models inside of RSA that we, we work with with a number of suppliers to, for, I suppose, to do deep data analysis to identify our new fraud trends. But we also have some very strong manual controls. So we do still go out into the offices and train handlers how to spot fraud. And we have checklists in a very similar way to a number of other insurers. Um, but for me, it's our social networking technology, which we use at RSA, which is a product provided by BAE Systems. Um, which is a, a net reveal product. There are a number of social network analysis products out there, but um, the, the one that we have um, over the years, we've sort of increased our fraud identification by over 50%. Um, we've had to reshape our business and our models, our processes, um, and all of our people. And we really made a step change in detecting insurance fraud and increasing our fraud savings. Mm. You are talking uh, about internal uh, cause of fraud mm -hmm. and also external mm -hmm. uh, regarding the external part of the threat yeah. how do you do you um, specifically uh, cope with it so uh, my opinion is the fraudster will always find um, the weakest the weakest defenses <laughs> um, and, and, f and fundamentally if there's money to be made and you're you're effectively offering a service where a fraudster can obtain some form of financial um, <laughs> reward, if you like, um, they will go for it. Um, yeah. Whether it's insurance fraud, um, say benefit fraud, or any other type of fraud, um, we don't see, we, we do see a very distinct and very definite difference in fraudsters. You know, the organised criminal and very, very clever um, organised fraudster who is effectively a career criminal. Um, mm. that, is de that is without question, no matter which controls you put in, that person will adapt and see where else they can effectively still obtain their financial gain. Um, meanwhile, you have the opportunistic fraudster yeah. is effectively, um, unfortunately, a victim of some form of incident, accident, whatever it may not be, um, and um, just potentially exaggerate the claim. We do see that a lot. Yeah, this one is and, and I suppose the opportunistic fraudster is more impacted by external factors mm -hmm. than actually the organised fraudster. The organised fraudster is not really impacted by externals. Yes, it's, uh, it's a purpose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, the internal, fraud, the opportunistic fraudster, sorry, um, 
it would definitely be ex impacted by external factors, whether it's financial or circumstantial or, um, um, you know, personal. Yeah. Uh, re regarding the, this uh, fraud threat, uh, what are uh, the line of responsibility that are being defined? And is it the same uh, with regard to the different type of fraud that occur? Mm, so I don't, uh, sorry, the line of responsibility. How is it organized uh, to, 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 to manage uh, the, uh, the fraud uh, occurrence, the fraud uh, pattern or the opportunistic fraud? Is it the same uh, organizational framework? Is there a different uh, area of responsibility? Yes, so we have, a, a, I suppose, a, a bit of a toolbox approach of how we would tackle each different type of fraud. So. Um, an opportunistic fraudster will probably, yeah, we would deploy different controls, perhaps an interview, perhaps just a um, visit in the premises, visit in the, the policy holder, um, perhaps m treating more of a customer type approach to a, mm -hmm. to a policy holder or an opportunistic fraudster, whereas with an organised fraudster it's a very different set of controls because number one, you may not even be able to find them to have a discussion with them. Mm -hmm. so, so we do have very different um, approaches to how we deal with the fraud. And uh, is there some uh, communication uh, challenges that uh, are being uh, addressed when uh, it comes to, to, to fraud topic? So one of the big challenges over the years has been to get the message across that fraud is not acceptable. Mm. It's still seen as a socially acceptable crime um, and it's a very difficult message to get across to the public because it's, it's still very much, oh, you committed an insurance fraud, ha, 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 aren't you very clever? Um, you don't get the kind of social response to that, which is, this is not acceptable, you're taking money out of my insurance pot, you're taking money out of my wallet. Um, I think there's some work to be done, and the ABI in the UK are looking into this, of how we actually communicate better with, I suppose, suspected fraudsters, potential fraudsters, and really the organised fraudsters and I think with the new digital world, the new communication methods we have, maybe through name one of the social networking sites, I probably shouldn't, but we need to start perhaps thinking differently about how we get that message out about potential fraud and why you really perhaps shouldn't commit insurance fraud. Um, it's a difficult one, I think it involves some psychology, it involves um, some financial question, you know, some financial um, insight and maybe questioning, but it's a uh, it's an age-old challenge. Do you continue to beat the fraudster over the head or do you actually communicate with that person and, and try and prevent it in the first place? It's an yeah, ongoing battle. Ongoing <laughs> battle, yeah, as you <laughs> say. <laughs> I, I want to thank you, Adele. Is there, uh, uh, as a conclusion, uh, a key takeaway or uh, a topic uh, you would like to, to highlight in addition? I, I think the, the key takeaway for me is that the fraudster will always choose the path of least resistance. Um, but as RSA, as an insurance company, we have a plethora of tools that we have out there to try and prevent, detect and hopefully stop that fraud going forward. Mm. So really the message from me is if you're thinking about committing some sort of insurance fraud, um, perhaps don't knock on RSA's door. Okay. I want to thank you for this interview. Okay. Thank you.